You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda, here from New York City. And this is Prashant Parmaswaran from Washington, D.C. How's it going today, Prashant? Good. How are you doing? Doing well. Uh, we're uh, doing this podcast to discuss some pretty significant news in Asia. Mm -hmm. We're recording this on August 9th. Uh, so four days ago, the Indian government, um, led by the Bharatiya Janata Party, the uh, right-wing Hindu nationalist government, uh, made a major decision regarding the status of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which is what India calls its administrative um, arrangement for uh, for the larger disputed region of Kashmir. And the decision uh, is, in simple terms, to modify Kashmir's status internally within India, removing a constitutional provision that had granted the Indian state a great deal of autonomy. Um, so this... This has obviously been seizing headlines, and I think uh, many of our listeners will be aware that this has happened. Uh, but I figured over this podcast, we could talk a little bit about the significance of Article 370 in India and why sort of previous governments had not taken this step. Uh, so for the BJP and its ideological predecessors and fellow travelers, uh, abrogating Article 370 of the Indian Constitution, which codified a special status for Kashmir, has long been an objective, but it's not something, for example, that the former prime minister of the BJP, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, was able to do during his terms in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s. And the main reason for that was, I think, domestic politics. Vajpayee was ruling in a coalition government, and by contrast, um, Narendra Modi and his government today enjoy a coalition strength, uh, sorry, a, a, a strength in parliament that no government has really enjoyed in, in several decades. So this major step was something that the party had wanted to do for a while. We'd actually seen this promised in the BJP's manifesto, for example, before the 2019 elections. And uh, Amit Shah, the Indian Home Minister, uh, made the announcement on August 5th to the upper house of parliament, the Rajya Sabha. And effectively, there were a set of proposals that resulted in the not only the abrogation of Article 370, but the reorganization of Kashmir internally in India. Uh, so Indian sources are calling this the bifurcation of Kashmir, which I think is a good way to uh, talk about it. The erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir under the Indian arrangement is being divided into two. So the state of Jammu and Kashmir no longer exists, but what will come into existence now are to union territories, which in the Indian federal system refers to any sort of um, sub-federal uh, constituency that is directly governed by New Delhi from the center. So there's no uh, self-government or local governance there. Uh, but the two union territories will have um, two separate names. So one of them will be Jammu and Kashmir, which is a successor to the former state, although it will not occupy the same geographic space as the former state because it will only pertain to the western part of uh, Kashmir and um, the Kashmir Valley and Jammu. And then the other union territory is uh, Ladakh, which is largely the western part of the Kashmiri region, um, ethno-linguistically distinct. Uh, it, borders the, um, it borders China. It specifically borders the Chinese-claimed part of Kashmir. And of course, there's a lot to talk about here, Prashant, because um, with with any any major development in Kashmir, the geopolitics are immediately apparent. We have competing claims from China, competing came, uh, claims from Pakistan, broader concerns about the um, a stability in the region with the pending U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. But that's sort of a very high level view of the Article 370 issue and and why it matters in India. Of course, the ground situation in Kashmir is also worth pointing out. Kashmir is on total lockdown. In the days leading up to the Article 370 announcement in the Indian Parliament by Amit Shah, India ramped up its uh, paramilitary force presence in the Kashmir Valley, putting the entire place on lockdown under uh, under a total information embargo. Many Kashmiris probably still don't know exactly what has happened to them. Kashmiris living outside of New Delhi haven't been able to get in touch with their family members. Um, there are now reports that um, food stress is beginning to uh, beginning to set in, despite assurances from the Indian government that um, provisions were made to prepare for a lengthy lockdown. And of course, there are serious concerns about an Indian crackdown on human rights more generally uh, in the Kashmir Valley. So that's that's kind of the broad overview. If you haven't really been following this issue that closely, but you've seen a few headlines, uh, hopefully you're up to speed. And uh, yeah, Prashant, I guess uh, the next place to go. I mean. 
you know, were you were you really uh, surprised when this happened, or or had you been expecting the BJP to kind of swoop in and do something major like this? I mean, like like a lot of these trends that we discuss on on the podcast, I think this one is kind of in the bucket of it's something that has been discussed before, but even when the move is taken, given the significance of it, you are kind of surprised about the scope of it and the reactions that come thereafter, right? So as you said, I mean, this is something that's been talked about before. Um, and I think it's become clear to the current Indian government that the sort of status quo in Kashmir and India-Pakistan relations, you know, doesn't really hold up and there's something that needs to be changed. So there's always been a little bit of discontent on that on that end. And we did see, as you correctly pointed out, you know, the military buildup um, on the Indian side um, over the days that uh, previous to the announcement and also this sort of crackdown on information uh, that we actually continue to see um, as of now. Um, that being said, though, I mean, this is a significant development because of, you know, the context that you talked about. Right. So, you know, the, the Kashmir issue, this is something on which, you know, two nuclear armed powers have gone to war on previously it gets to not only security issues and geopolitical issues that we talk about on this podcast, but it ties into issues of identity and power that get to the heart of the formation between India and Pakistan. And I think it, it really gets to this this question of, you know, what is the practical significance of this move, right? So even if India thinks that the status quo in Kashmir is not sustainable, is this a, a wise move for India to take? And I think you, you'll find differences of opinion. I think on, you know, if you're a supporter of Prime Minister Modi or even the, the Modi government, you would argue that, you know, the status quo is unsustainable and something kind of needed to be done in this regard. And this is something that they've announced, um, you know, previously, in, including in the policy platform. So folks shouldn't be surprised. But on the other hand, I mean, this this notion of, you know, cutting into issues of autonomy, which is in general is a pretty controversial notion in India, um, because there's a notion that you'll have less of a say in your political affairs uh, the the sort of notion that, you know, for critics of Prime Minister Modi, the idea that you're imposing sort of a Hindu nationalist vision on a, a state that's Muslim majority in nature. Um, and also the fact that, you know, the Kashmir militancy, which we've discussed uh, on in this podcast before, um, it really has been an issue that India has struggled to deal with uh, in previous years. And if you view it from that perspective, you, know, you can't help but think that the situation uh, like this would actually make that worse rather than better, at least in the short term. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that's kind of the lens in which I'm viewing it. But the other aspect of this, since this is an Asia geopolitics podcast, as you pointed out, is, you know, what are the responses from these other countries that we've talked about? You know, there's responses within Kashmir, but also from Pakistan, from China and the United States. And maybe we can talk a little bit about those international responses and how this gets to the geopolitical context of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before we get to that, though, uh, you know, you brought up something very interesting about um, how the BJP has been justifying the move. And I think that's worth discussing a little bit, mm -hmm. um, because I think I think for the purposes of the regional geopolitics discussion, which I'm very interested in getting to, uh, you know, we can we can view this as a revisionist move by India. Right. Um, of course, I think people in New Delhi would disagree with that because uh, the view there is that this is a matter of Indian domestic law. But um, I don't think there's any arguing that this has a very serious kind of revisionist component insofar as the region more broadly is concerned. Um, but but the BJP's justification, uh, it's not only about the militancy, it's about the overall um, development of Kashmir. There's been a lot of uh, sort of references to the fact that bringing uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh under union territory status will lead to better economic outcomes. Of course, I think that very much depends on the broader security situation, right? I mean, if we're looking at a protracted um, bout of uncertainty and uh, unrest, I think that's going to be less likely. I think it's also worth stating that Ladakh is a very different case from the rest of Kashmir for, um, I think, the Ladakhis had actually resented to some extent being part of the larger state of Jammu and Kashmir for as long as they had, because uh, given their ethnolinguistic and sort of broader differences um, and also the, sort of their uh, geographic sequestration from the rest of the state, uh, preferences there were actually quite different. So in a way, I think that is being viewed positively. But the main concern for Kashmiris and Prashant, you know, you hinted at this with your um, references to the Hindu nationalist project is that uh, the abrogation of Article 370, with it, takes away another part of the Indian Constitution known as Article 35A, which had um, defined who could be a permanent resident of Kashmir. And what that had practically done was kept out non-Kashmiris from living and settling in Kashmir and sort of changing the demographic nature of this Muslim-majority region of India. 
Um, and that is now going to change. And the longstanding concern among Kashmiris is that the abrogation of Article 370 not only deprives them of autonomy and a high level of self-government, but sets in process um, a long-term demographic shift in the in the Kashmir Valley, which I think if you ask New Delhi on what the long-term solution is to solving kind of what we've seen over the last uh, two, three decades, which is a gradual shift towards um, you know, a disenchantment, especially among the Kashmiri youth with the idea of India and an Indian national identity. The solution is to gradually change the demographics of the region such that uh, Kashmir itself is is fully integrated into India, even though Kashmiris themselves might not be, right? I think I think that's what the the Kashmir debate, you know, I mean, to be a little bit cynical, I think for both India and Pakistan, the interest in Kashmir has always really been more about Kashmir itself and less about the Kashmiris um, on, on, on both sides of the line of control, which is the border demarcating the Indian administered and Pakistani administered sections of the of the region. Um, Kashmiris do not enjoy particularly uh, high levels of, um, you know, uh, freedoms or civil liberties in any way. And I think um, this process is really going to accelerate that. Uh, but the BJP, yeah, I mean, has been has been kind of justifying this in very practical terms. Uh, Amit Shah also made references, for example, to uh, women's rights, you know, saying that the Kashmiris um, were not uh, respecting women's rights in any particular way. But of course, you know, we could we could talk about the BJP's record on that on the rest of India in a, in a separate conversation. Um, moving on to the geopolitics, um, I think the place to start should be Pakistan. Um, I think uh, the Pakistani reaction, at least what we've seen so far, has been you know pretty straightforward. Uh, they the Pakistanis have downgraded their diplomatic ties with India, uh, sending home the Indian High Commissioner from Islamabad. They have suspended trade with India. Of course, uh, India-Pakistan trade was never, uh, you know, a massive sum to begin with. Um, they have been, you know, here in New York City, the Pakistani uh, permanent representative has been meeting with all kinds of stakeholders across the United Nations, including at the Security Council, to raise Pakistani concerns. And uh, yeah, I think the most serious component, though, is the Pakistanis have said that they are reviewing bilateral arrangements with India. And uh, one of the things that's, I think, concerning to me there is the, uh, you know, a, a possible decision by Pakistan to no longer uh, respect the uh, 1972 uh, Shimla agreement between India and Pakistan. That was the agreement um, signed after the end of the 1971 war, which uh, cleaved Pakistan in half, uh, creating the newly independent state of Bangladesh. But more importantly, what it did was it sort of set in place the rules of the road for how India and Pakistan would, re would relate to each other uh, over Kashmir and manage their differences bilaterally. It also codified the line of control, changing its status from the UN ceasefire line. And if, if Pakistan did take that action, Prashant, I think, I think that would be the most significant political signal from Islamabad that uh, you know they would be willing to risk a a war over over this decision on Article 370. I think the Pakistanis are are seeing this as a as a difficult thing to deal with, and you know we just have to look at the broader situation in Pakistan, uh, given the um, fiscal crisis and broader uh, um, inability for the country to really deal with its international problems, including um, its um, its pending decision at the Financial Action Task Force later this year. So the Pakistanis are in a tight position, but obviously I think the Pakistani military, which um, calls the shots on uh, national security policy, is going to have an important say. So I think we're still waiting to see. Right now, it doesn't seem like the Pakistani military is heading in that direction, uh, but we have seen some uh, saber rattling from the uh, the chief of the Pakistani military's public relations arm, for example, who's, who referenced the February 20, uh, 2019 crisis earlier this year and said that if India tried anything similar, that Pakistan would react uh, disproportionately. So um, I think I think those concerns are, are pretty significant. Uh, but yeah, I mean, um, what do you think about uh, the Pakistani reaction so far? I mean, I, I think this is something that, uh, you know, we, we talked about a, a little bit before on a, on a previous podcast about uh, the situation in Kashmir more generally. But I think in the contemporary context, what is interesting is this is coming so soon right after, um, you know, Imran Khan's visit uh, to Washington, right? where there were all kinds of, you know, measures of commentary about, you know, what does this mean for the future of U.S.-Pakistan relations? What is Imran Khan's foreign policy agenda? And it does seem that this uh, this issue uh, really is a, a key test for how Pakistan manages its external relations. And it seems like this is something which, you know, in the, in the, in the upcoming months, it really will be interesting to see how the Pakistanis react. As you said, so far, the reactions have been pretty 
expected. Um, and I think what folks are looking to see is, you know, is there going to be any major military action uh, that follows given the major constraints that the Pakistanis face uh, domestically? And, you know, I still think that that's kind of the the bigger question that's uh, looming here. Um, but I think the, the big question for, you know, India and Pakistan more generally in the situation is, you know, if the situation uh, with respect to Kashmir and India-Pakistan relations is unsustainable, you know, how are both sides going to manage um, the construction of a new normal for ties moving forward, not just on the Kashmir issue, but on the bilateral relationship more generally? And I, I still don't think we've seen uh, clear outlines yet in, in with respect to policy, because Modi has this new election mandate and you have Imran Khan coming to power in Pakistan and a lot of domestic issues to sort out. So I, I, I tend to think that it's still a kind of wait and see game with respect to the Pakistani reaction, um, at least for now. Mm -hmm. I yep. think the other uh, important uh, sort of lens to view this from is how other major powers have, have reacted. So the big one is uh, China, as you mentioned, right? Because China is, you know, effectively a claimant with respect to Kashmir, and and it, you know, unsurprisingly came out in in opposition to this, you know, so-called unilateral move given its own claims and and what China's position has been before, which is a, a kind of a close alignment with Pakistan. That's kind of on the one hand. But the other interesting one is the United States, right? Given, you know, Imran Khan's recent visit where there were, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, manners of reports about, you know, the extent to which President Donald Trump was going to, you know, involve himself in the Kashmir issue uh, during Imran Khan's visit and whether the Indians had actually given uh, the United States consent for that, which has always been a very controversial issue. Um, in this episode, what was interesting is we we saw a little bit of back and forth with respect to whether India had actually notified the United States yeah. on actions it was going to take with respect to uh, Kashmir or not. And the United States, I think, was was very keen to push back on notions that it had approved or in any way consented uh, to this measure. But it nonetheless, you know, with respect to China and the United States, I really think that that's another lens through which to view uh, this major issue, even though it's primarily an issue between India and Pakistan. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, you you just raised a bunch of, um, I think, I think uh, great issues to delve into. Uh, you know, going back to Pakistan and the response. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Imran Khan's visit was initially celebrated but as a sort of better than expected um, bilateral visit, uh, especially that moment in the Oval Office when he got Trump to make up that exchange with Modi, where you know he, he claimed that Modi asked him to intervene. Um, there has been some reporting in India that that sort of bout uh, during Imran Khan's visit pushed the BJP's hand on timing. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I think as we emphasized at the beginning of this podcast. I would not say that this is something India did because of Trump or anything like that. This is something that the BJP has wanted to do for a very long time. And yeah, maybe sure, the timing might have changed um, given what happened in Washington during Imran Khan's visit. The other, the other part of Pakistan's reaction that I think a lot of analysts are waiting to feel out is how the pending U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, which very much relies on Pakistan's um, acquiescence, is going to play out uh, if Islamabad decides that it's going to apply pressure on the United States. For example, if Pakistan feels that Washington is being unfairly, um, you know, kind of um, sympathetic to India's interests here, it could begin applying the pressure, making um, American withdrawal from Afghanistan more difficult by using uh, whatever um, influence it has on the Afghan Taliban. I think I think that's a serious concern. Um, and I think that's also been part of the reason why India decided to make this move now. It's easier to make a step like this in Kashmir while the United States is still in, Af in Afghanistan as compared to after withdrawal. Um, you know, I think the other thing that the Indians are probably thinking about is how American withdrawal from Afghanistan is likely to influence the role of sort of international terrorist groups, including Al Qaeda and the Islamic State, who have taken an interest in Kashmir. Uh, so taking the step um, before that withdrawal happens, I think, made a lot of sense for New Delhi in that regard. Regarding China, uh, yeah, so I actually, I actually just filed a column on this issue uh, for the South China Morning Post looking at how this is going to affect the India-China border process. And I think that's a very, very interesting question. I haven't really seen it been talked about too much because I think everybody's rightly focused on 
Pakistan and the line of control. But yeah, I mean, India and Pakistan have a, you know, three and a half thousand kilometer line of actual control, which is effectively a unresolved border uh, in Kashmir. Uh, the new union territory of Ladakh effectively will be cut in half by that line of control, a uh, line of actual control, which will separate the Chinese controlled region of Aksai Chin from the Indian administered part of Ladakh, which will be ruled directly by New Delhi. Uh, some Indian commentators have suggested that this was actually a very smart move by the Modi government strategically to bifurcate the state because then you're effectively dealing with two separate disputes with China and Pakistan through the prisms of two new union territories as opposed to previously when the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir was simultaneously a part of uh, two separate border disputes with two separate neighboring countries. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that angle. But I think what I will say is that, you know, the, the 22nd round of the India-China boundary talks is supposed to take place later this year. And I th I'll be very curious to see how China uh, chooses to harden its position on other issues, right? Because for, for years, we've been sort of working towards this east-west swap in, in the India-China border issue. That was always going to be the template for a border solution that India would get to keep Arunachal Pradesh, perhaps with a few exceptions, in exchange for China getting to keep Aksai Chin. That made sense given administrative realities. India administers Arunachal Pradesh as a full-fledged state uh, with a, um, you know, it, it's been investing more and more in infrastructure in the region, um, empowering politicians from the state and national politics. And meanwhile, China has uh, occupied Aksai Chin um, from the 1960s and has developed uh, all kinds of infrastructure, including um, PLA forward garrisons there. So that was always going to be the template. But now the problem is with Ladakh being fully incorporated as a union territory, uh, the Indian government, first of all, has a problem in now making that concession domestically. It would kind of amount to giving up territory that is directly under New Delhi's rule. But the other issue is that China is likely going to harden its position over other claims, including the uh, Arunachal Pradesh region of Tawang, uh, which has been of uh, particular interest to China. Uh, so I think uh, this does complicate that process quite a bit. Uh, you know, Beijing's complaint, I think, was a little bit disingenuous. I think the the Chinese statement said that India, by changing its domestic law, had violated Chinese sovereignty, um, which I think is an interesting claim, especially given how China uses domestic law in the South China Sea, for example. Um, but uh, I think I think, yeah, Beijing is setting itself up for. Uh, a full-fledged reaction, and I expect that we will see the effects of this begin to play out um, in, in any future dialogues that India and China have on the border. The one final issue is that the Chinese statements were very interesting in what they said and didn't say about Pakistan, right? The Chinese foreign ministry released two statements after a fairly lengthy delay. I think it was about 13, 14 hours after the Article um, 370 abrogation announcement before China said anything. Um, so one of the statements was that India and China should handle this in a response, uh, India and Pakistan should handle this in a responsible bilateral format and handle things peacefully. They didn't explicitly support Pakistan in any way. And then the statement where they did express concern, it was very much focused just on the Ladakh issue and the India-China border dispute. It, it really had little to do with Pakistan. The Pakistani foreign minister, um, Qureshi, has gone to Beijing now to consult with China. So it's possible that position will change in the next days. But the initial Chinese reaction was very much focused um, on, on, the, um, on the issue of the border dispute with India directly. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think the, the U.S.-China dimension of this, given that, you know, both of them are, are major powers and, you know, have a lot to do with some of these uh, regional flashpoints from various perspectives, is something that's interesting. But the, I think the bigger issue as well, as we've been kind of discussing so far, is, you know, how much of this decision by the Indian government was motivated internally versus externally, right? And obviously, the messaging from the Indian government has been more on the internal front. But nonetheless, this has external implications that I think are really important for us to get through. I thought one of the really interesting things, you know, just talking a little bit about the future prospects for this is, you know, Prime Minister Modi and his, you know, sort of televised address following this was very keen to actually message this as something that, you know, this is not just something that's good for India. It's something that's good for Kashmiris and for Kashmir as well. Um, and I, I did find that interesting, you know, irrespective of whether, you know, the extent to which this is going to be credible to Kashmiris on the ground, given the fact that we, you know, haven't really been able to actually get a sense for the full situation, given the crackdown um, in the area. Um, and I, I sense that, you know, given how things have played out with respect to the situation in other countries, whenever you have, you know, these sort of crackdowns and issues of autonomy, you tend to get a little bit of potential unrest uh, coming to the fore. 
Um, it was interesting to see that, I mean, at least the Indian government is paying attention to this domestic angle of, you know, how are Kashmiris actually going to see this narrative um, and how the Indian government can manage this. But as we've talked about, you know, throughout this podcast, a lot of this stuff will also be determined by the role of external powers. And I think the United States is an interesting case, given the fact that, you know, we're talking about this in an environment where the United States is moving forward uh, towards an election in 2020, when it's not clear if President Trump will continue on for another four years or we'll have another administration. But we are proceeding on a track where uh, Trump does seem keen on reducing the U.S. presence uh, in Afghanistan, as you mentioned earlier, which requires it to actually lean a little bit closer towards Pakistan to make sure that that situation is actually stabilized. And I think the Indians kind of understand that broader regional context, but it does seem that this decision, at least in terms of the messaging, the Indians have really focused on the domestic component of this to make sure that it's actually being messaged uh, correctly, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, you bring up an interesting issue, which is uh, that the next 18 months of the U.S.-India relationship, I think, are going to be much rockier than the last decade has been um, on, on a strategic level. India and, India and the United States have had their bumps on the road um, over the last decade, for sure. But um, there's sort of a, a, you know, a multitude of issues that are coming to a head, uh, not only the Afghanistan withdrawal, but uh, I think Trump taking India to task for the trade imbalance with the United States, um, implementing tariffs, uh, which India has retaliated to. There's the pending issue of India's receipt of the S-400 surface-to-air missile system, which is likely going to result in sanctions on New Delhi. I don't think the waiver is going to be a very likely proposition there. Um, and and yeah, uh, Afghanistan. I think I think all of these issues um, do set up a, a long list of challenges. Of course, I think what India is also betting is that the United States will eventually forget about these issues and remember that India is an important important partner in the balancing coalition against China and in efforts to create a so-called free and open Indo-Pacific. So um, maybe the Indian bet there is right that at the end of the day, these kind of broader uh, geopolitical interests uh, in the India in the India U.S. relationship will prevail. Um, and you know, I mean, there's always the interesting counterfactual, which is that uh, India. I think expended a lot of domestic capital and international diplomatic capital in this Article 370 revision, and would it have would it have that much capital to spend, especially internationally, um, if we hadn't just seen the Modi government spend an entire first term where it really invested a lot into developing, especially the U.S. India relationship. Uh, the relationship with China obviously went through doldrums, but uh, I think Modi's first term was in many ways setting the groundwork for this. Um, of course, you know, uh, I think what's also going to give at least um, investors and sort of multinational, uh, multinational corporations interested in India a bit of pause. Um, and I actually had this exchange on, on Monday shortly after the Article 370 uh, decision uh, in a conversation with a few uh, India-based um, business people who were wondering about the implication. And one of them actually said that, you know, this, uh, you know, Modi has this sort of penchant for making major nationally relevant announcements with very little indication, right? I mean, we had the anti-satellite test uh, earlier this year. We had the demonetization decision, which was huge and had disastrous consequences. And now very similarly, the uh, decision to abrogate Article 370, which occurred without any kind of internal deliberation or consultation. Uh, you know, even the security forces that were sent to Kashmir were sent there under the pretext that there was going to be, uh, there was some kind of credible threat uh, of, of violence. Uh, nobody really knew that this was coming um, in, in the way that it did, but but it did yet again. So the BJP, I think, you know, is, is full of surprises at the end of the day. But sometimes those surprises are, uh, you know, a, a different way to frame that would be that it's it's also uh, very risk tolerant in, in ways that previous Indian governments weren't. Um, and I think that has uh, important regional um, consequences. And of course, I think as far as risk tolerance goes, we can also talk about the events of the end of February 2019, right, when the Indian government retaliated against Pakistan um, in in a way that I think very few analysts had predicted, uh, which was the use of air power uh, across the uh, across the line of control into Pakistani territory. But um, yeah, Prashant, I think we're uh, running a little short on time. I know we could talk about Kashmir for a lot longer. Uh, but yeah, is there anything you wanted to leave us with as a parting thought? No, I, I would just say, you know, going back to, you know, the previous times we've discussed this on this podcast, it really will be interesting to see how this affects the situation in Kashmir itself, right? And the situation with Kashmiris and the militancy there, because that's been something which I think India has been really challenged to deal with. So 
it'd be interesting to see how that affects those local dynamics. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks a lot for joining me on this uh, very uncontroversial podcast that I'm sure is going to upset <laughs> no one in either India or Pakistan. <laughs> Thanks. Good to be with you. Um, great. And for <laughs> listeners, if you uh, like what you heard, uh, please uh, leave us a review on either iTunes or Google Play. And make sure you subscribe as well so you don't miss uh, future episodes of the podcast. You can do that on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or any other number of podcast providers. Uh, if there's something you'd like us to discuss on the podcast, uh, we had a lot of requests on Kashmir this week, unsurprisingly. Uh, just drop us a note on uh, Twitter or via email, and, and we'll try to incorporate it into future programming. So uh, thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back next week with more.